So you say you can't fall asleep, you can't get enough sleep. This is a Healthier Michigan podcast, episode 127. Coming up, we discuss some trending sleep hacks that claim to help us all fall asleep quicker and stay asleep longer, but questions are many. Do they work? More importantly, are they safe? Welcome to a Healthier Michigan podcast, a podcast dedicated to navigating how we can improve our health and well-being through small healthy habits we can start implementing right now. I'm your host, Chuck Gatica, and every other week we sit down with a certified expert and we discuss topics covering nutrition, fitness, and a lot more. And on this episode, we're going to dive deep into how we can get better rested after sleeping by exploring a few hacks that have been found on social media. Because let's face it, some of us go there, right, and play Google Doctor to figure things out. But with us is a real doctor. With us today is care management physician of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, Dr. Angela Seabright. Good to see you, doctor. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, we're glad you're here. And this is a big thing because, you know, you can look online for things. You can find studies. And some of the studies are really quite impressive and important. For instance, according to the CDC, one in three Americans... Uh, adults are not getting enough sleep on a regular basis. We know that sleep is essential for every process in the body, and according to your alma mater, University of Michigan, it affects our physical and mental functioning, not only at that time, but the next day, our ability to fight disease and develop immunity, and then our metabolism, which could be an equal sign like maybe weight gain or something, and even your chronic disease risk. Does all of that seem to make sense to you, that if you're not feeling your best, then you could be having other issues? Absolutely. Sleep is where we restore and rejuvenate every function of our body. When we think of self-care and wellness, you know, we think about our diet, we think about exercise, but we need to start thinking about sleep as well. It's part of the package and it's essential for our well-being. So just because I'm a nerd, you know, and I like to watch videos that explain things that I didn't know before, some of it's really useless. In this case, it wasn't. I was watching a video the other day talking about the mitochondria in our body and how sleep kind of cleans up even cells in our body. And I thought, wow, I never thought of that. I just thought I was getting a good night's rest, right? Right. It's almost as if you're going through a detoxification process while you sleep, which is pretty awesome. Well, it really is. And that then puts an asterisk or really an exclamation point after the fact that we really need to concentrate on this idea of good sleep. So if you do what we did, scour the internet and try to find some sleep hacks that are supposedly there to help us, the question then becomes, do any of these hacks really work? And sometimes they do, but of course it's all based on context. So in your opinion, what are the main causes of why people don't get a good night's sleep? Oh, there could be so many reasons. Sometimes people have trouble falling asleep. Sometimes it's that they can fall asleep, but that they're staying asleep or they're early awakening, which can be particularly frustrating. So what causes insomnia? Sometimes it's related to poor sleep habits. Other times it's beyond our control. Maybe people who have to travel or a work schedule, you know, that's keeping them up at night. Health problems, certainly way up there, can cause poor sleep. Think about, you know, acid reflux or chronic pain. These are conditions that can keep people awake. And then, of course, certain medications, substances such as nicotine and alcohol, caffeine. These are things that can negatively impact our sleep as well. Yeah, we've heard the phrase a lot over time, sleep hygiene. Do all of those things and fixing them fall under that phrase, sleep hygiene, or is there more to that? Yeah, so sleep hygiene refers to, you know, the habits and the environmental factors that can improve our sleep. So we need to identify the root cause of a sleep problem, and that's the best way to, you know, correct these sleep issues. So there are a lot of tips when it comes to sleep hygiene, and the biggest one and my favorite is maintaining a regular sleep-wake cycle. So having a bedtime, I know as adults, we don't really think that we should have a bedtime, but you really should establish a bedtime and a wake up time that is consistent, even on the weekends. And you want to make sure that your sleep wake cycle aligns with our environmental cues, meaning you should be sleeping a couple hours after the sun goes down and waking up around the time that the sun comes up. That's our body's natural clock, and that's going to be, you know, most conducive to good sleep. Other things that we think about when we think of sleep hygiene are regular exercise. 
You know, when we think of exercise, we know the benefits for our cardiovascular health, our weight management, possibly even our mood, but we don't always think about it for our sleep. And studies show that regular exercise can promote better sleep just as long as it's not done, you know, too close to bedtime. You kind of want to wait two to four hours before you go to bed. Other things to think about with sleep hygiene is the timing of our meals. So you don't want to have very large meals. You don't want to, you know, drink excessive fluids. You want to limit substances that we talked about earlier, like caffeine, tobacco, alcohol, all of which, you know, you should limit in general for your health, but you certainly shouldn't be consuming too close to bedtime. And, you know, often uh, you've got inputs that sort of drag you along, often kicking and screaming into this new rhythm of your body. For instance, two of our kids just had babies literally within two weeks of each other, and they're about three months old. Well, they joke about it now with us because they're going to bed earlier than we do. And they look at my wife and I and say, oh my gosh, we're going to bed at 7, 38 o'clock. But they've gotten a new rhythm because the babies get up earlier in the day in both cases. Right. So that's a case where you really don't have a choice. Those little ones, you know, an infant sleep cycle is totally different than an adult. So you're kind of at their mercy and it can be it can be frustrating, it can be tough. I've had three children myself, so I've I've been through it. It does pass. They do eventually get on a better schedule, but certainly that is one of the examples of a disrupted sleep cycle for sure. We had five kids, not to trump you on that, but we and I sometimes I forget like I know we went down to Florida on a vacation, all five of them, and I still I didn't block it out because nothing bad happened, but I just don't remember how we managed it all, but somehow it all worked out, you know. It's all a blur. (laughs) Yeah, it is. So let's talk about some of the sleep hacks, not necessarily, you know, prescriptions or getting a CPAP if you're diagnosed with sleep apnea. Important, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about this idea of social media itself, maybe the thing you're falling asleep with, a screen on your phone or your iPad or something, is allowing you now to see a bunch of hacks that have gotten out there into the stratosphere so that we're now getting them inbound and we're seeing these things, trending sleep hacks that are coming off from various places, including TikTok. So here's one that we found, reducing the temperature of your bedroom. I know for me personally, I like a cool room at night, but is that a real thing for everybody? Yeah, that's actually a good tip. So the temperature in your bedroom does play a role um, in your sleep quality. So if you've ever slept in a house without air conditioning on a warm summer night, you know how difficult that can be. The tossing and turning, the kicking off the sheets, you know, it's just not optimal. So studies show the best temperature for sleep is around 65 degrees Fahrenheit for adults. And, you know, the temperature preferences can vary from person to person. We all have our, you know, preferences, but our bodies naturally cool down a couple hours before bedtime. So that's part of our natural clock or the circadian rhythm you may have heard of. It uses cues from our environment, again, the sun, the light and the dark cycle, and certain hormones are activated based on whether it's dark outside or light, and that alters your body temperature in preparation for sleep. So cooler temperature, better sleep. Now, if your body temperature is higher, that's actually going to promote wakefulness. So higher body temperature, especially your core temperature, it's linked to a drop in your deep sleep. And we know that deep sleep is extremely beneficial. That's where our bodies recover and repair. So certainly cooling down the room can help, whether that's, you know, turning on a fan, opening up windows, using sheets and comforters that have fabric that are cooling. I know that in the wintertime, I use, you know, a thicker comforter, but maybe that's not, you know, the best idea in the summer months. And then also, this is really interesting. Taking a warm bath can actually promote your body to cool down, which sounds a little counterintuitive. No kidding. Yeah, but the warm bath or the warm shower actually kind of forces our body to go through a natural cooling process. So many people say that, you know, especially with infants or young children, giving them a bath before bedtime will help them fall asleep better. And that fan thing can be a bonus because not a ceiling fan, maybe, unless it's a noisy one. But, you know, getting that white noise from a fan off to the side of the room may be one of the things that helps you fall asleep, too, outside of cooling you off. Yeah, especially for those light sleepers, they really need to have that white noise to drown out, you know, any other noises that may be keeping them awake. Well, I saw this one and I just, I had to wonder because I I, I will admit to you now, I'm a fan of almond milk, right? I use it, to me, it, it's kind of funny. I still think somebody's got a strainer somewhere and they're just pouring water over almonds and somehow that's what I'm getting. 
But I saw this next one, not about almond milk, but lettuce water. And I <laughs> that's what made me think of it. I thought, that's the goofiest thing I've ever heard of. But is it? I agree. I think it's, you know, I mean, I have to force myself to eat lettuce. I'm not sure <laughs> I'm sold on drinking the water. But... Which is water anyway, right? I mean, isn't yeah. it all water? Yeah. I actually had to look this up because I hadn't heard of this. But apparently there are some sleep enhancing substances in green romaine lettuce called lactocarium. I might have botched that. And so the substance was actually extracted in a study, but the kicker is this was a study in mice. So we have no studies in humans. We have no idea, you know, how much romaine lettuce you would need to consume or boil in order to get this possible sedative effect. So for that reason, you know, I really can't recommend this. I'm sure you can think of better ways to flavor our water. Sure. And to your point, too, that whole idea of of how much of the compound, like how many Caesar salads before bedtime would you have to, you know, that giant silver bowl that you have in the house. All right. So that one's, of course, skeptical. Then there's this other one. It's called the 478 breathing technique. What's that one? So breathing techniques are a great way to calm and relax your body. And this particular technique, the 478 breathing technique, stems from an ancient yoga practice called pranayama. And it's the practice of breath regulation, meaning, you know, you control and count your breathing. And the goal is to connect your mind and body. So in this technique, you would breathe in for four seconds, hold for seven, and exhale for eight. Now, if you're a beginner to this type of breathing practice, you should really only do a couple cycles so your body can get used to it. You know, a lot of us don't really breathe in that way. We breathe very shallow. So it is a good idea to take these deep and restorative breaths. And by doing so, you're activating the relaxation centers of your nervous system. We have two parts. We have our sympathetic nervous system, which is our fight or flight. You know, think adrenaline, which isn't really your friend when you're trying to sleep. And then we have our parasympathetic nervous system, which is our rest and relaxation. So your breathing can signal and shift your body into the state of relaxation. And there are actually a variety of different breathing techniques, not just the four, seven, eight. And all these methods, you know, not only can help improve your sleep, but they can decrease stress, increase your mindfulness, again, that mind-body connection, reducing your heart rate or blood high blood pressure. You can improve your lung and cognitive function. So numerous psychological and physical benefits to this type of practice. So breathing techniques, I think, are definitely very helpful for relaxing your body, calming your body, and um, promoting good sleep. Well, you know, it's it's interesting because sometimes we think of breathing techniques to calm our minds. We're living in a world of anxiety, you know, during the day, or we're going to jump on a Zoom call for a meeting and just catch our breath. You know, we've got some previous episodes that talk about how you can do that in a short period of time. In my case, I have another issue. I try to pray myself to sleep. And then, of course, I forget half the people I was trying to pray for. So I have to pick up the list tomorrow. But, you know, there are so many different techniques. Some are ancient, some are newer. But that whole idea of calming yourself, you know, I have to admit that for me, I don't necessarily right away think of calming myself when I go to bed. I'm My mind starts to go. And that's one thing that I have to manage is, you know, the world is going and, oh, the ideas for tomorrow or what's on the calendar or I have to talk to you today. You know, I'm my mind is going. So it is it is helpful for me to calm myself down. Yep. It's that mind body connection and just focusing on something else than the laundry list of things we have to do the next day. Yeah. All right. So then we've got another one here, which is <laughs> mouth taping. I don't understand the whole idea because I know a lot of people are nose breathers. Some people are mouth breathers. Some people have sleep apnea. You better not tape their mouths, right? So you got all kinds of questions, but what's the real skinny on this one? Okay. Where's my no button here? <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you. This is just as bad as it sounds. I mean, you're taping your mouth shut, which is basically forcing your body to breathe primarily through your nose. And we should never have to force our body to do something. We know, like you said, nose breathing is better. So, you know, they've got that down. Mouth breathing can cause dry mouth, sore, irritated throat, bad breath and snoring, which, you know, could potentially negatively impact the quality of your sleep. But we really don't have evidence to support this. And and any benefits are purely anecdotal, kind of like the lettuce water we talked about earlier. So if you do suspect your mouth breathing or, you know, if you're snoring and usually your partner will let you know if you're snoring, you should talk to your doctor to figure out the cause. 
You know, it could be a structural issue such as a deviated septum, sinus or allergy problems. You could have enlarged tonsils, could be related to sleep apnea, as you mentioned. So definitely the mouth taping, I have to give this a no. Yeah. And I, I'll bet you there are a few spouses who want to tape their other spouse's mouth, right? Because of uh, this is really funny. I'm out to dinner the other night with uh, friends of ours. And the wife is admitting that she sleeps with earplugs, doctor, because her husband is snoring so loud. Now, they're still in the same bed, right? They admitted all, I mean, we're really good friends, so I, I didn't really learn much more than I needed to. But I, I relate to it because I was at that point where my wife finally said to me, you better go get an overnight sleep test. You better go get tested. Sure enough, I had sleep apnea. I have fixed it. It's working fine. I love my little machine. It goes with me anywhere I travel. And it's just one of those things that it's not a hack, but it's a real thing. And you're not just affecting yourself then. Right. All right. So let's get your input on this. The idea that when it comes to sleep trends, there are ways that we can all be encouraged and you can encourage our listeners as well to be on the lookout when thinking of trying that kind of a hack, those few examples we gave or any other new one that may come away or an old one. What are we looking for as signals that this may be legit and try it? Yeah, you know, when I hear of hacks, it just kind of sounds like the search for a shortcut. And there's really no shortcut when it comes to your health. We know that it can take weeks or months to change some lifelong habits that may be impacting your sleep. It could take several appointments with your doctor or treatment plans. So while social media may have some fun tips for other things, I think when it comes to your health, you really should seek help from a professional. Yeah, and you touched a little bit on meals. I always found it interesting when traveling. In some countries, they don't even start dinner until 9 o'clock at night. And I guess people are sleeping fine. I can't eat that late. But that idea of snacking your way to bedtime, that's one of those ways that uh, you've got to manage that part of your sleep hygiene, right, if that's one of your issues? Yeah, you really shouldn't be eating large meals at bedtime for many reasons. But going back to that temperature conversation we had, you know, eating raises your core temperature. And so, you know, your body's trying to digest and process the meal that you ate. So that's one of the reasons. Another reason is, you know, if you're prone to acid reflux and you're eating a heavy meal, maybe a spicy meal right before bed, that can keep you awake as well. So you really want to steer clear of, you know, a large meal right before bedtime. Is there anything in your personal practice, because I know you've dealt and still do dealt with patients of all ages, where there's one issue that people come to you most often with that you see more regularly? As far as sleep, um, I see a lot of, actually, it's ironic because our whole talk today is about, you know, the social media tips, but a lot of people are spending more time on devices. And so, the blue light from the screen, whether it's your laptop or your cell phone, you know, that's actually sending the signal through your eye to your brain that it's light. And so light will actually suppress melatonin, which is the hormone that signals our body to sleep. And so it's very activating and it keeps people awake. So I think a lot of people are just so busy during the day and at night, they're maybe trying to unwind with social media or texting on their phone. And so that light can be very activating and kind of sabotage their ability to fall asleep. And then certainly just, you know, stress. A lot of people have a lot of stress and anxiety. And if you're not addressing that properly, whether that's with, you know, mindfulness techniques or seeking professional help, then, you know, certainly that plays a big role in our ability to sleep as well. So as we wrap things up, any other takeaways you want to give us things to think about when it comes to either hacks or, or real good ways to deal with this idea of getting a better night's sleep? Yeah, I think making sleep a priority is very important. As I said earlier, you know, when we think of wellness, we often don't think about sleep, but it's so important for our bodily functions and our overall health. And I have to say something that's really corny, but if you want more sleep, you've got to snooze the TikTok, you know, just turn off the social media <laughs> and just yeah. go to bed. Yeah, no, that's good advice. And, you know, so much of this stuff is such straightforward you know, common sense, and then we all fall into habits. You know, it just happens for any number of reasons. You're so right. It's very difficult. Well, Dr. Angela Seabright, it's good to have you with us, and thanks for your time. This is a great topic. Yeah, thanks for having me. Take good care of yourself. We're glad you were with us. Listening to a Healthier Michigan podcast is brought to you by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. If you like the show, you want to know more, check us out at ahealthiermichigan.org slash podcast. You can leave us a review or a rating. 
On Apple Podcasts or Spotify, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. And you can get uh, new episodes, old episodes. We're up to what today? 127. So there's a lot of great content there from some fabulous experts. You can take it with you as you go. Don't go to bed watching this stuff. Uh, You can also subscribe to us on uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. I'm Chuck Gatica. Stay well.